thank Science Oxford for inviting me here this evening. It was really funny because I got an email and it said, um, we have the Shell Wildlife Photographer of the Year display and we'd really like to invite you to come talk about your research. And I thought, oh, they're really interested in the research I do on nocturnal primates for the last 17 years. And they said, no, about the Yeti, which is something I just did this summer. And so uh, I'll, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it if this works. So basically, I'm going to give you um, several topics to this talk, and I'll show you them all here. First of all, how did I get involved in the search for a Yeti, and what is the context in which I'm going to tell you about my involvement today? And then, then I'm going to show you some other examples of scientists who have actually sought the Yeti in a scientific context. I'm going to tell you about some fossil apes that do actually exist, that are by some people considered to be real Yetis and to talk about the potential that they may still exist. I'm also going to look at um, the discovery of new primate species and new species in general that are still being discovered today and show you that there are things out there that we don't know are out there and how that might be able to provide any evidence for something like Yeti. And finally, at the very end, the results of the very small research project that we did this summer that got me invited here today. So, uh, the story starts in Meghalaya in India you can see a map here where the state of Meghalaya lies close to the Bangladesh border, close to Bhutan in the Himalayas. And you can see there a photograph of No Greg National Park in the Garo Hills. And we were contacted by uh, some individuals working <coughs> in this area. It's a relatively remote area. There have been very few wildlife studies conducted in the area. In fact, there's 8,000 square kilometers of forest that you can say is relatively unexplored. And so um, the people living in the area report the existence of a primates. They don't call it the Yeti, they call it the Mande Barung. And the Mande Barung is another word for a bomber or snowman, you may have heard it, the Sasquatch. And in fact, it's known in many countries around the world where it has a different name in all of them. <coughs> what you see here is a, a photograph, I don't know how well you can see it, from the Garu Hills. And this is a man's foot, and you see a shape of a very, very large footprint in which he is standing. And people believe this was made by the Mande Barung. It is possibly a rock formation, but what I do want to say about the size and shape of that foot, um, there are also regular footprints that are seen in villages of the same size and shape that people report to be coming from this animal they call the Mande Barung, or the forest man. And these stories stem back for centuries. They're passed down throughout lineages from parents to their, from grandparents to their uh, their children into their children. The person who was really searching for the Yeti is called Deepu Marak. He was first working with a group of uh, colleagues and friends, and he was very interested in the fact that many, many villagers reported the story of the Mande Barum. They gave a very similar description. They all described it as this. This is a forensic sketch of the Mande Barum, a black and gray like <coughs> animal weighing up to 300 kilograms. In the other parts of the talk, I'm going to show you lots of other animals and their sizes, and you could get a real concept of how large 300 kilograms is. It, it's reported to be anywhere from um, 7 to 9 feet, about 3 meters tall. And it's reported going into the forest and ripping open branches and scraping off the bark and eating the sap from inside branches. And it's uh, also very interestingly, and this is one thing that compelled us to actually follow up on this story, it's reported to make ground nests out of vegetation. When we look at gorillas and chimpanzees, uh, also very large apes, they do make ground nests out of vegetation, and they do it on a nightly basis where they fold them, and they have a very characteristic look. And the nests that were reported from this area were similar to these ape nests, so that was actually interesting to us, because if you're going to make up a story about a primate, to know that much about the ecology of an ape was a little <coughs> bit compelling. And these footprints, like I showed you, they're reported very often. So, as the story keeps going on, um, Deepu contacted Alistair Lawson from the BBC, and there he is, standing on the India-Bangladesh border. He went out there for a few weeks, he recorded the stories of these people, <coughs> and he is the one who actually will, uh, who got into, into contact with us. These are the couple of the people he interviewed, uh, some local villagers from the area. This uh, woodcutter, Nelbisan Sangma, he reported seeing it three days in a row. 
He had to take a five-hour walk into the forest where he was cutting wood. He said he saw it across the river. It was a tall, imposing figure. He could see it very clearly. He saw it breaking open this wood and again eating sap. And he said that for him to get to the closest camera would have been a 10-hour walk, uh, basically there and back. So five hours in and five hours back. And he felt that <coughs> if he, it was so amazing to see it, to see it for so long, that it wasn't worth the walk to get the camera. And most of these cameras would have just been a, a pretty poor quality camera anyway. This author, Llewellyn Marek, he's a very devout follower of Mandi Barung in the area. He's uh, written local reports on it. He's collected local history. He reports when he was a young boy, he saw it come to his village, and he was the only one who wasn't terrified and actually went out to look at the tracks that it left, and he saw them fresh there in, in the dirt. And so uh, he actually says basically the forest, forest department are a bunch of useless, lazy individuals who want to hide the truth from the people, and uh, that's why they're not out there looking, looking for it. There's only one forest department, um, <coughs> I guess, venture where they actually claim to see the Monte Barung, and that was a, a tiger survey where 14 individuals who are out on the tiger survey actually came across it. And so what happened is, uh, purportedly, this ET <coughs> was seen by this uh, character here, and they went to the area where he where he'd seen it, where I'd been breaking apart the wood, and they found hair samples uh, that it had left on a rock near the wood that it was breaking, and they collected the hair samples. They were given to the Department of Wildlife, who thought it was a joke and were a bit embarrassed to analyze it, and these hair samples were actually a few years old. So eventually, when Alistair, the BBC reporter, <coughs> went to investigate it, two individual pieces of hair were given to him. So he brought them back to the UK. Um, I just wanted, before I get into to exactly the next part of this, with these hair samples, I like this quote. It comes from a slightly different part of the purported Yeti's range, and it was, um, it's a quote by Pollyanna Pickering from Derbyshire. What struck me most was, it wasn't like they were trying to convince me it, the Yeti, existed. They were surprised some people think it doesn't. It's no big deal to them. It's another indigenous wild animal. And this was her forensic sketch of the same animal, reported by the people in the area who all said, oh yeah, well, we see it all the time. And so I think uh, the little take-home message for this is uh, just to give you, a, I guess, the devil's advocate if the Yeti does exist, is there's a lot of British animals you know exist. Let's just take something very small, like a dormouse. You all know dormice probably occur in England, but hands up who's seen a wild dormouse? Very small proportion of you. So, but we all believe dormice exist, so these guys believe their, their Yeti exists. But uh, they're really special, you should see a dormouse, really beautiful. Um, all right, so this, this character now, he's called Ian, Ian Redmond. <coughs> he's a colleague of mine for quite a long time back, and he works on conservation of great apes. And uh, he was contacted by the Natural History Museum in London, and they basically said, oh, some other person has brought in Yeti hair, and they want us to analyze it, we've had enough of it, will you take it, because you're interested in apes. And being interested in great apes and knowing a little bit about the historical distribution of apes in Asia, Ian said, well, I'm interested, and, and if this ape does exist, if it is a primate, it might be really endangered, and we should really actually try to look properly and see what those hairs are. So he contacted me, and uh, why did he contact me? It's a completely uh, strange connection, perhaps, even though I do study primates. I work at Oxford Brookes University, and uh, we have a nocturnal primate research group. And for uh, the last, for me, about the last 17 years, and for my colleague for the last 40 years, we've been looking at nocturnal primates in Africa, in Asia, in Madagascar, and now we have students as well in South America. What's important about nocturnal primates is they're cryptic, and they're cryptic in a couple of ways. And uh, this is going to tell you about why I was given hair samples to identify. The first aspect of crypsis is they're just difficult to see, just like our dormice. We go to the field, I work in Asia, my colleague works in Africa, and we say, well, have you ever seen this animal? Well, I know it's there, but I've never seen it. And occasionally you have people say, well, yes, there's this kind and this kind, whereas science only reports one, they'll tell you there are two. When you go out into the field, you often do find there are two, but because they're brown and boring and out at night, people have only identified them as one species. So we're looking at animals that are nocturnal, that are small, that are difficult to detect, that can all be very similar colors because they're not using vision to detect each other as species. So we use other means to try to determine if they're species. 
So you can't find them, and they also are difficult to detect as a species. So these are some of the methods we use. These are two species of bush babies. It's again a little bit bright, maybe for you to see it. But um, there are two different species of bush babies. This one is Galago senegalensis, and this one's Galago maholi. This one's found in South Africa. This one's pretty widely distributed. It goes into Senegal, it goes into East Africa, parts of East Africa. And if you can see it at all, one thing you might notice is he doesn't have a little black patch above his eye, and he does. And that might be the subtlety that will describe one species from the next. They still have that similar yellow on their flank. They're small, they're brown, they're both around 300 grams. If you look at it a little bit closer, you can see the one with the little eye patches. You can see it in a black and white image pretty well. And this Senegalensis has the little round eyes. And other aspects we look at are hand pad morphology, the shape of the hand pads to see if those are distinct. And we could also look at their coals. And one thing with these guys, they're using coals as mate recognition systems to, um, to find their mates. And even though you may have thought they looked really similar, this is really one of the keys we can use. slightly louder version of that same call. And now uh, the other species that was thought to be the same species for a long time, this is its call, it uses to attract mates. <laughs> so if we just go back to those little guys, they look really similar. But for all these reasons, they're cryptic species, they're different species, only identified, I think the, this one was maybe 1987, 1986. So, and many more of these bush babies discovered in the last five and ten years. Here's where we get into yetis now. We also use their hair to identify these species of bush babies. So if we put, pluck out a piece of their hair, again, you could see the one with the eye, uh, the eye patches is purple, the one without the eye patches is yellow. They have different scale patterns on the gross morphology of the hair. Scale patterns can be coron uh, coronal, petal, or umbriculate. And what you see here is a, a petal pattern where they don't overlap. An umbriculate scale pattern would be virtually a smooth uh, strand of hair, whereas a coronal pattern would have scales that overlapped each other. And so, um, but what you can also see is these have, you can measure them with a, a microscope and see exactly how wide each of the patterns are and they're just like a fingerprint to the species. We can also look at the microscopic structure of hair. And when we look at <coughs> these, we have different, different parts of it. And the main are the outside of it, the cortex, or the medulla, which is the center of it. If you envision a pencil, say it's a, one of the typical yellow pencils, with the lead being the medulla, and the outside of the pencil being the cortex, the width of the cortex and the width of the medulla and the pattern of the medulla will also tell us something about the species. And again, just like our scale patterns, the medulla could be interrupted, it could be continuous, it could be a ladder-like scale, shape, etc. If I just show you two side-by-side -side examples, uh, this you'll notice only has a little tiny bit, but in general no medulla at all. And this is characteristic of a human hair. Human hairs tend not to have a medulla, especially European human hairs, and this is a badger. And you can see with this dark medulla with little granules giving it a, a scale-like pattern within it. And these should be pretty much species specific, or at least it could give you, at least it could tell you if it's a primate or not, um, or a non-human or not. This brings me to my research very quickly. Um, these are two species that I discovered, or one of them I discovered, this one, the red slender loris from Sri Lanka and hair scale patterns were one of the, the ways we distinguished it from this guy, the gray slender loris, a different species, also found in Sri Lanka. And, uh, and again, you could see the facial mask. It's very rounded eye patches. This is a diamond-like eye patch, very large yellow ears, relatively small brown ears, and little characteristics that uh, help us to define a species. Similarly, more lorises from Sumatra. Uh, this one from the south of Sumatra, this one from the north of Sumatra, and again, their hair scale patterns are extremely different, but if you look at them, you have, again, different patterns that help you to see species, but they do look very, very similar, so cryptic species. And I have to say, we've discovered lots of bush babies and lots of lorises, and no one's ever, no reporters have ever come to talk to me. <laughs> and I, I was sitting in this lab when I had these two hairs, 
minding my own business, and about 18 reporters were in the corridor going, oh, do you think it's a Yeti? Can we film you? Can you do it in English? Can you do it in French and in German? And we had Japanese and we had uh, Indian reporters. And I was like, come on, it's a new species of critically endangered primate. What about my lorises? They kept showing them pictures. Can you put that in the paper with it as well? But, uh, but they, were very interested. they were very interested in the Yeti. So um, one lady's like, can I touch it? Are those the real hairs? So, uh, so that's how I got involved in it. And, um, and why would I have done it in the first place? Because I actually thought it was funny. It was the summer. I was in Torquay seeing my fair lady. And I got this phone call waiting in the queue. And it, and it said, I have these Yeti hairs. Do you want to help? And I thought, oh, that's really funny. And I'm sort of on my holiday. And, uh, but also, I'm not a believer. Or I'm, I don't believe or disbelieve. And I think the evidence I'm going to show you now could show you why you may or may not believe or disbelieve. And the first is there have been other people who have looked for this at a, in a scientifically rigorous way. The first of my examples, ooh, yeah, so other scientists searching for the Yeti. The first example isn't necessarily scientifically rigorous, but it was one of the first people who went on an expedition where he was looking for the Yeti in some way. And this is Sir Edmund Hillary, the famous climber of Mount Everest. And uh, in 1960, in one of his subsequent trips to Mount Everest, or to the Himalayas, I should say, he... Um, Notice that footprints left in the snow by humans, when they melted over a period of time, they got very long and very large. And so he said, well, we can debunk this idea of, of a yeti because clearly people have these traditional beliefs. They like stories of the, of the supernatural, but you can see where it could come from because when you leave footprints in the snow, they become very large. He was given this lovely hat here, which was reputed to be of yeti hair. He had a couple of them. And, uh, and he actually brought, some, brought, it, brought it back here, where the hairs were actually analyzed. Um, and, and they were said to be a Yeti scalp, so he got it from Nepal. In fact, it turned out to be a Sirao, which is a, a little mountain goat you see here. And uh, he said, I'm inclined to think that the realm of mythology is where the Yeti rightly belongs. And uh, one of the things you'll see when you hear about Yetis is people often think they're a bear very large animal that could stand upright. And these Sira, even though they're maybe 20 kilos, and they can stand upright, they don't really look like a 300 kilogram, three meter tall animal, like a bear might. But we'll talk about Sira again later. Grover Kranz is my favorite Yeti scientist. Uh, I teach human evolution as well. I teach human evolution at Oxford Brooks and at University of Oxford. And I always love to tell the story of Grover Kranz because he was a really controversial scientist. He actually was really shunned a lot because he very passionately wanted to prove the American Sasquatch as a true entity. He collected avidly footprints of it. He was um, the scientist. The Patterson-Gimlin film, again, it's very <coughs> bright here, but that's that famous film of the, of the Sasquatch walking, and they have him in the, um, for two minutes, they have a frame of him, and the rest of it, they're riding on a horse, and it's a very jumpy frame, Then he turns around and looks at the camera. And... Uh, People have said, is it filmed in 16 millimeters, in 20 millimeters, in 24 millimeters? If it's filmed at different speeds and we walk that speed, can we cover the distance that an animal that tall would have covered in that length of time? And Grover Krantz analyzed it and was convinced that a human couldn't walk the distance covered by the creature in the film in that length of time, which has been a big <coughs> evidence for the Sasquatch. He also is very famous. Um, I'm going to mention Homo erectus again later. And he, Homo erectus is a, a hominin that lived from about 1.8 to about roughly 500 to 300,000 years ago, depending on which theory of human evolution you accept. And it had a brow ridge. And humans, modern humans, lack a brow ridge. And Grover Krantz uh, famously made himself a prosthetic brow ridge to try to look at the function of it. And he believed it had a sexually selective function, and he wanted to see if women found him more attractive <laughs> than his prosthetic brow ridge. And I think they didn't. So then he had the sun visor idea, because it did block the sun very well. So he's, he died in 2002, and he was a real colorful character in, in this whole story. And those are a number of his books, if you're interested. Uh, possibly a more credible scientist who's widely accepted as a credible scientist is Rosh Shahan. And these are two of the films he's been in, Sasquatch, Legend Meets Science, and Giganto, The Real King Kong. And, and his claim to fame is really that he discovered many uh, remnants of or fossils of a very large <coughs> ape that lived 
in the past that I'm going to tell you a lot more about in detail in a minute, called Gigantopithecus. And he actually found that Gigantopithecus lived side by side with Homo erectus, and that's going to generate some other theories about whether Bigfoot exists or not. I uh, like this study that was done in 2001 down the road, University of Oxford, and the geneticist Brian Sykes was given some Yeti hairs, and he, uh, he wrote this, or he has this quote, we found some DNA in it, but we don't know what it is. It's not a human, not a bear, nor anything else we have so far been able to identify. It's a mystery, and I never thought this would end in a mystery. We have never encountered DNA that we couldn't recognize before. And so we read quotes like this, and we thought, oh, that's really exciting. Will we be able to recognize our Yeti hairs? And uh, similarly, an even more exciting study was published in 2001, 2004, in the April 1st edition of Molecular Phylogenetics and Evolution. And uh, you could get it free online as a PDF. Molecular phylogenetic analyses indicate extensive morphological convergence between the Yeti and primates. If you know anything about taxonomy, one thing we're looking for is to avoid convergence wherever possible because it's not parsimonious. We want to try to relate things to each other. But what they found, the hair that they had from this very primate-like looking animal that's reported to walk upright and look like a monkey. It just looks so remarkably like a horse. They said, well, if it's really a yeti, then there's remarkable morphological convergence between the yeti and the horse. Uh, they actually were scuppered in their view, which they themselves admit in their paper, by Tintin. <laughs> and if you've ever read Tintin in Tibet, Captain Haddock, when he meets the yeti, he says, you are toad ungulates. <laughs> and uh, so they say, 40 years before their discovery, um, the Captain Haddock had it right when he was able to identify that the Yeti was in fact a horse. <laughs> so as you can see, there are, those, uh, there, are, there are those scientists who seem to have some evidence for the Yeti, those who passionately believed it, those who tried to put it into a scientific framework and who, who didn't take it seriously. And I suppose you can put it in the realm of zoology versus cryptozoology. And even if it's a cryptozoological subject, you can still try to study it from a scientific framework and see if there's any reality in it. And so I, I now want to tell you a little bit about the, fi the fossil yeti. And uh, I'll let you look at some primates that are living today and uh, see if we can see if the yeti can exist or if it ever did exist. Another lovely uh, quote, the yeti is a relict species of early man driven long ago into dense forests by the surge of homo sapiens that presumably eliminated more primitive hominids. Its strange bestial foot would seem to place it closer to a sub-hominid such as Gigantopithecus or even to apes. And, uh, and many people now look at this Gigantopithecus, Giganto for short, as the potential yeti. If I go through the living apes first, some of you may have seen Susan Chain's talk last week where she may probably talked about gibbons and orangutans in Borneo. And gibbons are the smaller apes. Uh, there are four genera of gibbons. And as you can see, they range from 5 to 15 kilograms. And I, I wanted to put in some of the pictures of hanging from their very long arms or if they occasionally go to the ground walking on their very long legs. Because even though they weigh very little, they can be very tall. And we do get the, the hula gibbon potentially even though it's at the moment not reported in this area, potentially could be in that area. So that's one of the animals we actually tested to compare our yeti hair to. Um, if we look at the great apes, not great because they're wonderful, but just because they're huge, we do actually get a, um, a, a size range more approaching as 300 kilograms. But again, if you look, the smallest chimps are around 30 kilos. The largest gorilla is 185 kilos. If you had a really obese one in a zoo, it may get to 200. <coughs> and when they're standing on two legs, anywhere from about a meter to 1.8, two meters tall. So again, these, these living great apes, the gorilla, chimpanzees and bonobos and orangutans, they're still not really in the size of this yeti-like creature. And orangutans, remember them, because we'll come back to them as well. But if we look back in time, and in particularly if we look at this time period, so we're in the Cenozoic, 65 million years ago to today, <coughs> uh, starting with the extinction of the dinosaurs, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, we get rid of dinosaurs, we start to get mammals of modern aspect. But if we go to the Miocene, 23.8 to about 5 million years ago, we see the age of the apes. <coughs> and what we see is an incredible adaptive radiation of apes that occurred during this period. These are some of them. 
Uh, this is an early ape that's from the early period of the Miocene, called Proconsul. And uh, I'll show you their body sizes as well. And as we get closer to the five million year period, we get uh, apes like this one, Oreopithecus, found in Greece. This one, Shivapithecus, found in Pakistan. And they're very large, 40 to 90 kilos, 70 to 50 kilos, 30 kilograms. In fact, we have about 35 to 40 genera of apes. Uh, we have that today with monkeys. Monkeys weren't very successful in this time period. It was the apes that were successful. And, um, and what we see is, is 40 genera and even many more species. So apes, very diverse, the age of the apes. We're now in the age of the monkeys. And those four great apes, orangutan, bonobo, chimpanzee, and gorilla are sort of apes on the way out, apes at the end of their period of great diversity. The ape we want to look at isn't one of these guys, however, although Shivapithecus here, which actually looks a little bit like an orangutan, suggested to be a potential ancestor of orangutan, is also suggested to be closely related to our friend here, Gigantopithecus. Um, to tell you a little bit about G Gigantopithecus, I have to tell you about uh, Ralph von Koningswald. He was a German, he was a paleontologist, he trained in Berlin, he went to Indonesia, he was very interested in human evolution. He was working in the early, early 20th century. Uh, Eugène Dubois had already discovered Pithecanthropus erectus in Indonesia. There was a, a real acceptance of human evolution, people were testing Darwin's ideas. It was a very <coughs> exciting period looking for missing links. And he actually contributed incredibly well to our fossil record of Homo erectus in the Far East. And he found um, Homo erectus skeleton or skulls at Moja Kerto and Sangaran, two sites in Indonesia. Here he is working with his skulls. He was in close contact with another scientist working in China called Franz Weidenreich. And he went over to meet him, and they were going to compare casts of their materials, of their Indonesian materials, with the Chinese materials. At this time, Homo erectus wasn't a single species. They all had ideas, different genus names for these, for these specimens. And he went into a, a Chinese apothecary shop, and he was able to look at all the very exciting Chinese traditional <coughs> medicines, where we still see the funnel of our wildlife going today. Um, because animal parts are very important in Chinese traditional medicines. And he was looking at dragon's teeth, and it turned out to be a hominin, or a hominid, I should say, a, a type of ape. And he called it Gigantopithecus. And he called it Gigantopithecus blackie after another paleontologist who'd worked in China and discovered some similar uh, types of fossils about 20 years earlier. <coughs> In 1955, a shipment of these dragon bones was confiscated. It yielded a, another handful of teeth and a couple of complete mandibles, the jawbone of Gigantopithecus, and it placed it in these different provinces in China. However, because it was in a shipment, we don't know their exact provenance. We don't know exactly where they were found, and this gives us a bit of difficulty when we're dating them. Similarly, since then, more than a thousand teeth have been found in Chinese apothecaries, as well in situ, Lusheng Cave in Luzhou in China, also some fossils in India and in Vietnam of this giant ape, showing that it was very widely dispersed throughout Indochina and South Asia. So, uh, quite exciting. This is what it may have looked like. Whenever you see fossil reconstructions, the pretty white part tends to be the reconstructed part, and the brown part tends to be what we actually see. And uh, so, that's the, that's the mandible, the lower jaw. That's a partial mandible. Uh, and from this, this rest was reconstructed by our friend Grover Krantz. Uh, it was predicted basically on the mandible alone. We have no associated postcrania for Gigantopithecus. Postcrania are the bones below the head, essentially. That it was three meters tall, 250 to 540 <coughs> kilograms. That may sound like a massive weight difference, but the lower end uh, is females, and the higher end is males, and also we have two species. Gigantopithecus giganteus is actually about 100 kilos smaller than Gigant Gigantopithecus blackii. Uh, so they are the most sexually dimorphic species of ape that we think ever lived, as well as the largest species of ape that ever lived. Sexual dimorphism suggests males are larger than females. When males are larger than females, we tend to have a multi-male, multi-female uh, mating system. We tend not to have monogamy. Or we could have something like the orangutan, which goes to an extreme and is relatively solitary, because you're so large, you can't live in a group, 
because you'll compete for food, so you tend to be more and more solitary. The dates are a bit sketchy. The 1 million to 300,000 years ago for Gigantopithecus comes from the cave sites where we can get a good date. Uh, these teeth coming from various apothecaries can push it to maybe 13 or even 6 million years ago. But we know that it existed 1 to 300,000 years ago. And we know that it existed side by side with Homo erectus because our friend Russ Shahan earlier was the one who found it in the Lijang cave side by side 300,000 years ago with Homo erectus bones. <coughs> if we look at his gigantic teeth, there's a very large tooth. I wish I had a, a scale, but the only scale I could give you, you can remember a 185 kilogram gorilla. This is a gorilla jaw next to the Gigantopithecus jaw. So it was very large. And um, when you're this large, and why it was reconstructed with that big crest called the sagittal crest on its head, is because you tend to be a chewing machine. The teeth of Gigantopithecus are similar to those we see in pandas. They, um, they're very flat, they have heavy, enam heavy enamel. Species with heavy enamel tend to be chewing machines again because you need to be able, if you grind through your enamel, you can damage your teeth and not be able to eat anymore, so you tend to be able to endure wear. And it's argued that they could have even been eating a lot of bamboo based on uh, the, the dentition. We can extract fossil plant particles off of teeth as well, called phytoliths. And we've got phytoliths of some Gigantopithecus teeth. So even if it was a grinder eating a lot of bamboo, we also know that it ate fruit. So it was uh, also a frugivore. I just wanted to put this up as well to show you, well, first of all, what Homo erectus looks like and what this species here, Paranthropus, looks like. These are actually um, two specimens from Africa, and in Africa, Homo erectus is usually referred to as Homo ergaster. They were both found in East Rudolph in uh, Kenya, and they were found side by side in the same deposit, and this is a period, these species live side by side for at least a million years. This guy here is very Gigantopithecus-like, incredible jaw, incredible chewing power, with a sagittal crest, the crest on the top of its head, very large cheekbones, all to withstand chewing forces. We do have associated postcrania for this one, and that very large uh, masticatory apparatus, the chewing uh, facilities, it, it still is relatively small. So based on the Paranthropus idea, some people say, well, Gigantopithecus may have been very big, but not that huge. Because if we look at one where we have postcranium, we know it's not so huge as it looks. But uh, another theory is that because these two live side by side, some people say this one never died out, and this is the big foot we see today. But they were only about three and a half feet tall, so they're not fitting the, the <coughs> scheme so well. Here's a reconstruction of Gigantopithecus. And it just leads me to the end of this section about the Gigantopithecus hypothesis, the Bigfoot Giganto hypothesis. Based on this, uh, this comparison with orangutans, one of the largest apes, uh, that's living relatively solitarily, potentially because of competition for food resources, it suggested they could have been semi-nomadic, relatively solitary, uh, <coughs> dwellers of the thick forest, that they could have been adapted to living in high altitudes in the mountains, because this is where they're seen today. This is all based on testimonial evidence. Um, because they occurred, occurred in the same cave deposits as Homo erectus, that these animals met. And when they met, because if Gigantopithecus was around earlier than Homo erectus, potentially they could have died out due to competition with Homo erectus. <coughs> Homo erectus could have killed them. Uh, or they could have had competition for bamboo. If you know anything about the far eastern fossil record with Homo erectus, you may know that Homo erectus is distinguished from earlier hominins by its use of Achillean hand axes, the really sophisticated tools that go a step up from the tools used by the preceding hominins, Homo habilis. And they're missing from the far east. <coughs> Since modern people in the far east use bamboo a lot in tools, some people hypothesize that Homo erectus in the far east also use bamboo as tools. And therefore, they suggest maybe if Gigantopithecus was an incredible bamboo <coughs> eater, this competition for tools and food could have driven them out or further into the mountains where they became nomadic, and uh, etc. cetera. Uh, this then meant they were so afraid of Homo erectus, early on in their evolution, they developed a fear of humans. And this fear of humans was deep set and lasted through a million years, essentially, of evolution. And this is why they still evade humans today, and this is why we don't see them. So this is our 
Bigfoot Giganta hypothesis, and you can see it on about 8,000 sites on the internet. <laughs> I'm really excited. My picture's all over the internet now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, new primate species in the Yeti. Do we still find new primate species today? Well, yes, we do. These are little tiny guys. These are the mouse lemurs from Madagascar. And um, you can see they're only 50 to 75 grams. And these are these kind of cryptic species that they may have all been lumped in together with other species. They still are rarely seen. They're out at night and they're small, but new species of primates. You would think we'd at least know about all the primates or all the mammals. Still in Madagascar, because it's such an interesting place for finding new species, to um, larger ones. And what I want to tell you about these guys is, um, oh, there it is. So, so they're still small, but they're larger than 50 grams. Um, another kind of cryptic species named after John Cleese, the Monty Python comedian, because he really loves lemurs. And I don't think he gave them a donation, but he did get his name. And he said it was better than an OBE. OB, OB, OB. Uh, and uh, this is a, a greater bamboo lemur. And why I wanted to put this one up is it was found in only one part of Madagascar, thought to be an extremely dwindling population. It's 25 to 30 breeding individuals left. And only earlier this year, a new population of 1,000 of them was found near the most visited national park in Madagascar. Of course, right on top of a, a, a mine, where they're going to be mining for minerals. But so, two kilo diurnal, very brightly colored animal went unseen in an area where there was a lot of research being done, where there was a great interest to find it. Let's get a bit bigger. These guys are, are, are two monkeys, Makaka Munzala from uh, our area of the world, Arunachal Pradesh, very close to Meghalaya, close to the area where we had our lovely Yeti hairs from. It's lar much larger than 50 grams. It goes up to 15 kilos. It's a macaque. It's a very large, gregarious monkey, very loud, hadn't been seen before. So finding a new large monkey in the area where this Yeti comes from. And we go to this one, Rungus ibis kapunji. It's uh, from Tanz Tanzania. Tanzania or Kenya, Simon? Tanzania. Tanzania. Okay, and um, that's right. In Tanzania was found not only a new species, a new genus. And again, about 16 kilos, really unique primate, completely bizarre. Um, and a relatively small population, isolated, was found, and it's already called critically endangered by the IUCN. And these guys, again, relatively rare, endangered. And so this means their population numbers are relatively low, which is partially one of the reasons they went undetected. Let's get a little bit bigger, get away from primates. But uh, here we have animals that we know that they existed. Borny and clouded leopard, again, we're looking at this cryptic species concept. It was recognized <coughs> there were leopards in Borneo. Still rarely seen, and rarely seen well enough to be documented that their appearance is extremely different from leopards in mainland Asia, so they've got named a different species. Uh, again, about 25 kilos. And then we have our huge Bornean rhinoceros. And although um, people knew it was there, the point I just wanted to bring up with, with this, this was a film in 2006 that was um, caught on a camera trap. And camera traps are something that would be really useful to look for something like a yeti. Uh, a huge animal, up to a ton in weight, possibly only 25 were thought to remain in Borneo. And finally one was caught on camera trap and very rarely seen. So a huge animal like a rhino that everybody's familiar with is something that's very rarely seen. So if you have a low population density, even if you know that they're there and you're going out and looking for them, it may take you years and years just to get a picture like this. Um, all right, so let's go back to our friends, the orangutans. Uh, these are apes that are found in Asia. They're found in the range where we might be looking for our yeti. And here you can see the historic range in the kind of blurry map on the top, but you can see that it's represented here. Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Malaysia, possibly <coughs> extended throughout that area, and you can see fossils going up into China. And orangutans were existing in Southeast Asia for at least uh, two million years. We have fossils that are like orangutans going back 13 million years, and the fossils of real proper modern orangutans really are about two million years ago. And even sub-fossils, those are bones that are just a couple of hundred to a few thousand years old, are still being found in caves in Thailand and Malaysia. So we know that <coughs> once existed in that area. Maybe this 
is the Mande Barung as well. Maybe the orangutan can be a candidate. The Mande Barung is sort of, yes, he's often being described as being orange colored. We have the black and white guy from, from Megalea, but it's very often described as being orange. And one thing that's interesting about the orangutan is it is relatively solitary, but this picture is taken at a rescue center. Once you get orangutans in a zoo or in a rescue center, they become extremely gregarious. They'll play with each other. They have really lovely social relationships. And it's suggested that, A, we can have this problem of resources making orangutans more solitary because they're so large, it's very difficult for them to have a large group size where they share resources. Or, due to centuries or thousands of years of hunting, they, again, got the sphere of humans. They're very bright orange. They're huge. They're loudly vocal. They reduce their group sizes to evade hunters. So if we see that in a living ape, we could possibly see that in something like a yeti as well. All right, last but not least, uh, the results of the research that we did on the Mandibarung. So um, <laughs> this is, uh, this is the, from the Oxford Natural History Museum. This is my colleague, Malgosha Novak Kemp. She was really good sport when they arrived in Oxford, these little hares. We kept sending a student and an Ian Redmond's son down to the museum. Uh, we, we, we first checked, well, we checked various hairs, and we kept saying, can you please send back other ones, because that one didn't work, and it didn't match. So we started with this little horse, uh, who everyone may have stroked down at the Natural History Museum, because the hairs that we had were very, very stiff, and we were trying to think of animals that had very stiff hair, and we were also trying to think of animals that would occur in Megalea that could be in the range of, of uh, our purputed, purported yeti. So we did check our uh, Aranichal Pradesh macaque, we checked the hula gibbon, we did try an orangutan, we tried a human, and none of them matched. So uh, in terms of the hair structure in the cuticle structure. We then tried my favorite, I was sure it was going to be a wild boar, <laughs> but it, it wasn't. And we were like, oh, it's not a wild boar, that's really exciting. The, the favorite, the Asiatic black bear, and my dog who's down in the front row, we tried him. <laughs> And I was really hoping it would be like him, because then I thought he could be on telly, but they didn't want him either. <laughs> and, uh, and we tried, other, we, we tried the several other animals that were of an appropriate body size that were found in the range, and none of them matched. So my colleague was quoted as saying, we have something potentially very exciting. We sent it off to New York, and we sent it off to Germany for DNA analysis. Before we did that, we took lots of photographs. Here you could see the center, the shaft of the hair. Here you could see the end of the hair. And as you can see, it had split ends. And we were really excited. We thought we could go like to head and shoulders or something and get a lot of research funding. If it was a Yeti, we could show it had split ends or Pantene conditioner. And, uh, and uh, you could see the hairs were 33.5 millimeters long and 44 millimeters long. We measured them. We measured all aspects of the shaft, etc. But there's one little animal we didn't check because it was little and it wasn't meant to occur in Megalea. And he was this guy, our favorite, our little goat. <coughs> so before we had a sea row, now we have its close relative, the goral. And um, when we sent it off to um, our colleague, Todd Dissetel in New York, he said, oh, well, it's a caprid and it, it's this genus here, Nemoridis, <coughs> which is a goral. And but what was quite exciting is that it's it's never been found in that area, so it was a new record for gorals, which are relatively rare animals. And, uh, and if you look at the hair here, you can see that <laughs> it, it's actually got a very similar <coughs> structure to, to our yeti. And had we, had we actually looked at a goat, it would have been really exciting to have done it without the DNA analysis, but at least it was confirmed, and it possibly gives us uh, geographic distribution information about a species that's a little known. One thing I should say about gorals and uh, Ciro in general, and why these animals might be getting picked up as being yetis, is they are living in very mountainous areas in general. They're adept climbers. They can reach these areas where we might expect to see a yeti-like animal, that's uh, you know, remote areas. They, are, um, they have scent glands near their eyes, and they're really good at rubbing their face and scent marking. They also have a latrine behavior, and when they go to their latrines, they also can rub and rub against rocks and leave hairs in their wake. They are, some of them are brown and black, or these, these colors that we might associate with yetis. So if we do have a guy like our woodcutter earlier who said he saw the yeti breaking up branches and eating sap and he went over, doesn't mean that a goral hadn't passed there before. He did actually see a yeti, but he just picked up the goral's hair instead. 
So it doesn't still mean presence of absence of presence doesn't mean presence of absence. <laughs> uh, as I was searching the internet, I found this on one of the websites. Sasquatch hair sample needed. Please advise if you have a sample. I was really excited to be able to send them mine, but obviously I can't because it's a goat. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, I hope that uh, this really told you a little bit about at least a scientific process when you're given something strange and why you might go about doing it. And that doesn't mean that yetis do exist or that they don't, uh, but that there is fossil evidence for these creatures. And if they do exist, and they could, you know, there's a lot of things out there that we don't know if they exist. What is very sad is that they probably will be endangered once they're described properly. So. Um, we, we wouldn't, if we do need to find these animals, we might need to go into these remote places with technology like camera traps. One thing that my colleague Ian Redmond is keen on doing is giving those local people uh, in the village proper cameras that they could bring with them, or cameras on mobile phones that they could bring with them if they do see something to take a picture. Um, because they, it is a very poor village, so they don't have big SLR cameras available. So, yeah, that's, uh, there we are. I just want to thank my colleagues. This is Ian Redmond again, my colleague John Wells, who helped us run the microscope, and, uh, and all the people who contributed to this very fascinating research. But if you do have any questions, uh, please let me know. And that's it.